All right, learning every day. <laughs> okay, now we, this meeting is being live streamed. Got it. Does that mean it will be saved on YouTube somewhere? Is it going to be saved on YouTube somewhere? Yes. You want it to be? If he doesn't want to, can we delete it? Because that's. Uh, would you prefer you not having? Cancel the live stream. Record it here. Yeah, we can just have it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind it being, I just don't okay. like the sort of permanency of it. Yeah. It takes five minutes to follow it. There are others online on YouTube as well. But... Okay. <laughs> what he told me, my shirt was that open. <laughs> okay, um, now it's four minutes past, maybe one more minute if folks are coming, I guess not many, and then we can start. <clears throat> yeah, let's see them some. Okay, good. Good morning, everyone. I'll record when I start, yes. Now we need somebody to tell me that they're here. I see that my camera is on and uh, I'm not muted. Can somebody signal? Oh, I can hear you. Ah, super, wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll just begin in a minute. Uh, wait, just let the chance uh, for the latecomers to join. Then I'll introduce the speaker and it will be a go. Yeah, water and everything. Yeah. Gonna come like this. Gonna have to skip that. Yeah. Waiting for Swati and then I go. Allo, allo? Tu veux nous joindre? Allez, bah bien. Il n'y a pas de monde. Je reste du coup jusqu'à 15 heures. D'accord, ça va prendre. Tu te libères quand tu peux. All right, a few more seconds and then we go. Uh, But Arvin wants to join, maybe. Just saw him pass. Yeah. Uh, yes, Arvin uh, wanted to join. That's what he told. Uh, okay, to I, just, party, I, guess. I just saw him pass away. So send somebody to pick him up. Oh. What's YouTube? Oh, mute. So perfect, we will begin. Uh, so, 
Thank you for your patience. I believe you can hear me. Uh, Shkini, can you just give me a signal? You for sure hear me? Hear yes, me? yes, yes. I can Super hear you wonderful. clearly. So actually, this is our first uh, event live in the department. This semester, we had another one before outside of the department. But it's the first time, and it's very pleasure to invite uh, Henry, or Dr. Henry Albury from Ghent University to join us live in person here in Manipal. It's very hot outside, although rather cozy, AC temperature here. Perhaps a few words uh, about us here at Manipal University, uh, philosophy of department who is organizing this. Uh, would have been amazing if our head of department could have been with us in person. Unfortunately, for health reasons, he couldn't be with us, so I'm doing all the words. Uh, I know, although I see uh, Shkinivasan being with us in person, I mean, in uh, live. So thank you for being there, all of you. A uh, few words about Henry. Well, we actually met a long time ago in Munich, uh, spent most of our PhD together and moved even almost, I mean, together to Ghent a few years later. So it's a pleasure to receive a colleague and friend here uh, in Manipal. Henry uh, wrote his uh, PhD thesis on Buddhism and society in the Indic North and Northwest. He published several articles um, on different topics related to Buddhism, obviously, with Buddhism in archaeology, say a few uh, topics of them, the relation between Buddhist monasticism and art. That's one of his latest uh, baby projects, a very fruitful um, research going on there. Some research as well public, uh, published on stupa and their destruction. That's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, on the archaeology of ritual in South Asia. Um, on the this one, I like that title, Astrobiography of Shakyamuni, the Buddha. That's pretty, uh, that's a pretty sexy title, actually. Love it. And uh, on South Asian rituals in archaeological context. It's a real pleasure to have Henry, and I won't take too much of the spotlight. To, uh, so please, uh, Henry, join us, and uh, you may introduce yourself a bit further. I think everything is going on well. Technically, you can just put your uh, PowerPoint when you're ready. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Carl, um, for your words of introduction and for inviting me here as well. It's a privilege uh, to be hosted here in Manipal and yeah, to come here and visit you and uh, present some of my research uh, to you guys. And uh, as uh, in Carl's summary um, uh, of my research, um, he noted two topics, namely the relationship between Buddhism and art and stupid destruction. And uh, my presentation today will uh, is somewhat of an amalgamation of these topics and attempt to bring them into closer conversation. So uh, we'll see what comes out of it. Um, and I need to share. Which button? Oh. Yeah, let me do that first. Oh, no, because now I need to. On this computer? Already on stage. I'm not, I'd have to go into. Need to do sorry, sorry for the delay. I need to set up a little. Oh, I was giving me one Oh, it's working good. Okay. Yeah. Um so my presentation today will focus on uh, a definitive moment in the history of South Asia uh, and uh, more specifically, and this is pertinent to our room Takshashila, 
on the region of Gandhara. So this is today's uh, Eastern Afghanistan uh, and Northern Pakistan, uh, and specifically around, around the turn of the common era. Um, because it is at this time that we first witness in the material records in archeology span and epigraphy, um, the widespread emergence of cults um, of the Brahmanical, Jain, Buddhist, and other local uh, deity and spirit cults. Um, and these include uh, such establishments as monasteries, relic stupas, images, temples, and so forth, which appear uh, for the first time. So uh, these different cults um, underwent a mass process of institutionalization, uh, and with it also an acute awareness of how they were to represent themselves uh, to society in order to gar garner patronage. And also um, the types of representational media that they were developing in order to achieve uh, the type of patronage they required. Um, now, the Buddhists, uh, also uh, uh, did the same, of course. And uh, today I want to focus on three types of media uh, that they produced uh, or that they utilized, perhaps is the more accurate term, uh, namely relics, uh, stupas and imagery. And in particular, I want to focus on three problems or paradoxes even that arose uh, within Buddhist ideology and practice uh, regarding uh, these three forms. So um, committed uh, as they were to the doctrine of Nirvana and the notion that the Buddha is totally absent uh, from this world, uh, the very value and significance of relics uh, came into question uh, at this time. Um, and likewise, uh, the stupa uh, too, um, whose aesthetic draw often being decorated with beautiful art and uh, decorative architecture uh, caused a number of issues uh, in light of the Buddha's rejection of sensual passion uh, and his ultimate rejection of aesthetic experience. Um, uh, and likewise, uh, images which were also created for their aesthetic draw, um, they caused issues for the Buddhists at an ontological level also because at the time uh, in South Asia, it was assumed that there was a necessary identity existent between the image, the representation, the pratima, uh, and its subject, uh, the prama. And the Buddhists rejected this ontological assumption, but this of course brought into question uh, the value of the Buddha image itself, to which we'll turn to at the end. So um, resolution uh, to these problems um, uh, was achieved uh, somewhat uh, within uh, law and practice, and in particular um, I, um, within certain monastic codes, legal codes, the Vinaya uh, of a number of institutions that were current in Gandhara, including the Sarvastivadins, the Dhammaguptikas, the Mahishasakas, the Kashapiyas, and the Mahasangikas. Um, and these works uh, sought to codify um, uh, a theory of embodiment on the one hand, which defined how the Buddha's corporeal remains were understood, um, as well as a theory of signs, uh, a semiotic ideology, if you will, uh, which rendered images um, powerless. It removed their agency and regarded them as only wood and stone. Um, now, these resolutions themselves were paradoxical in many ways, um, uh, and they, the paradox lay particularly uh, in the function and the significance of relics, stupas and imagery, and often how these three work together. So I'll begin just with a brief uh, introduction to the historical uh, context. So uh, Buddhism perhaps is we all know emerged uh, in the eastern regions of the Gangetic Plains around the fifth to fourth century BCE. And it wasn't until the third to second century BC that it began to spread westwards, first towards such sites, such sites um, uh, along the Yamuna River, such as Mathura, and then eventually uh, towards uh, Gandhara. Um, now it is from the second century BCE um, that we witness uh, a sudden abundance of relic and stupa establishments within the archeological records uh, and in a manner like no other in the context of South Asia. Um, so these uh, stupas, as you can see here, uh, littered uh, the landscape um, and they served from what we can deduce from the sources, two primary functions. 
So the relics were regarded as localizing the Buddha within a specific locale and therefore by extension, the Buddhist institution. Um, uh, and the stupa, the signifier of the relics, served this, uh, uh, yeah, this signifying function. Um, and it is therefore argued that the relics and the stupa were essential to the dissemination uh, of Buddhism. And indeed, um, it has enabled historians of Buddhism in South Asia to trace the movement of Buddhism um, across the subcontinent. Um, but the second function was uh, political. So the majority of these establishments were made in conjunction with the aforementioned monastic groups, the Salvastivadans, etc., uh, along with several rulers. So. Um, which can be divided into two main groups. On the one hand, we have the satraps, the chatrapas, and like the district governors or meridak, uh, as they took the uh, Greek name uh, in this case, uh, who were working as subordinates to the imperial regimes of the late Indo-Greeks, the Indo-Scythians, the Indo-Parthians, uh, and the Kushanas between the second century BC and the third century CE, which is when the majority of these stupas were, um, uh, when they were established. Um, but they were the most activity actually is to be attributed to two local groups of rulers called the Aprachyarajas, who governed over uh, Dia, Bajawa, and Peshawar. Uh, I don't know if my mouse, uh, they governed over these valleys here uh, to the west of the Peshawar plain and most likely Peshawar itself, as well as the Udirajas, uh, who governed over the Swat Valley uh, here. Um, so, um, Buddhist discourse establishes a parallelism between the dissemination of relics and the dissemination of uh, Buddhism. Um, but therein lies a problem. Relics were <clears throat> uh, established within stupas, um, but the nature of these two objects were paradoxical. So relics uh, are things that can be divided, they can be transported, and they are the essential power that is to be signified. But stupas are, uh, indivisible, they're fixed, they're designed for perpetuity, and they signify that uh, essential power. Now this created a problem because it necessitated, so institutional dis dissemination required institutional destruction, namely stupas had to be broken open in order for the relics to be spread. So this of course uh, uh, produced a strain uh, in the types of ideologies that we find in relation to relics uh, and stupas. So uh, stupas themselves in this region uh, were monumental in size. They were uh, beautifully decorated. Uh, the art is no longer to be found in situ um, uh, in most cases. Um, and they were placed in uh, be uh, beautiful locations uh, adorned with gardens and groves um, and so forth. Um, so they were good tools uh, for attracting patronage. But as you can see here from the, uh, the hole that has been bored into the side of this stupa, they also attracted other individuals who were seeking the relics uh, and the riches within. And this is uh, true from antiquity, uh, of course, until the present day, uh, where we know of uh, these uh, so-called clandestine excavations. Um, um, so, being nothing more than ossified matter, bits of ash or bits of bone, uh, relics are actually redundant apart from a signifier. They are unrecognizable as the Buddha's relics. And so therefore they require a betokening uh, uh, object, such as uh, the type of reliquary uh, that you see here, which was uh, dedicated by the Udiraja Ajitasena um, in the Swat Valley. Um, now, these reliquaries were often donated along with a number of smaller items, such as these uh, small silver and gold containers, uh, delicate little flowers or precious stones, uh, all of which were interred within, within the stupa um, uh, as part of the dedication. And they also came along with inscriptions, and you see here on the right uh, a gold leaf inscription. Um, and uh, another such uh, inscription which I would like to focus on, um, uh, was dedicated by the Udiraja uh, Sena Varma. So this is a gold scroll written in the Kaharoshti script and the Gandhari language, uh, which is a, uh, uh, an Indic language, but the script, the script is of course Semitic, so it's to be read from right to left. 
Um, uh, and this is um, this was dedicated in the late first century CE, uh, at a time when the Kushanas had just uh, invaded uh, from uh, just they just crossed the Hindu Kush um, into Gandhara. So um, this uh, inscription is uh, used to be the longest inscription that we had, and it provides a number of uh, important details for determining the nature of relics uh, and stupas, indeed. So let's, uh, I'll just read out the translation. So Lord Senavarma, Raja, and protector of the people, bows before the feet of the groups of noble ones, ascetics and brahmacharyas of the twofold community, as well as Priyadatta, guardian of the stupa, and proclaims that this Ikka Uda, which is probably Ikka Kuta uh, stupa, was established by the king. When the Ikka Uda was struck by lightning, an alteration to the burnt stupa was made by me. Everything was torn up and spread out and the original Shava was raised up and removed. Therein was an inscription concerning the establishment. Vasusena, son of Uttarasena, Udiraja and descendant of the Ikshvakus, he establishes the Ekva Uda. I established this, I established this relic, which is pervaded by conduct, concentration, understanding, liberation, knowledge and seeing. But whoever should burn the Eka Uda Stupa after it is fully completed, henceforth, where the god human Yaksha Naga Suparna Gandhava Kumbanda, may they fall into the great hell of Ichi. Mm. So we learn a number of uh, important bits of information from this inscription. Uh, the first concerns the nature of the corporeal relics as the embodiment of the Buddha. So they are described with the term dhatu, which denotes their elemental nature. They encompass the essential somatic nature of the Buddha, which is here defined as uh, in terms of the panchashila skanda, the five or the aggregates of the five sort of moral principles. Um, which constitutes the somatic makeup of, a, uh, of an enlightened being. Um, so this means that uh, a relic cannot be destroyed. It can only be divided. Uh, and this is of course an important uh, function or understanding uh, of how relics uh, work. And there are some very abidamic explanations of why this is the case, of course. Um, so the second thing we learn is that relics were subject to rededication. So in this case, Sena Varma refers to a previous inscription, which itself records a previous dedication of the relics. And he has taken the relics out of this uh, stupa uh, and rededicated them himself. Um, and this is um, a well-known practice uh, within Gandhara for which there are various numismatic, archeological, epigraphic, uh, and as we'll see later, uh, textual evidences. Um, the third is that stupas were destroyed. Now, the destruction of the stupa in this case was accidental. It was uh, destroyed by lightning, and this caused a conflagration um, uh, of the building itself. And this has been recorded by um, uh, the uh, Chinese monk, uh, Fa Xian, uh, who traveled from China in the fifth century. Um, he, and he records um, uh, that such phenomena was apparently uh, quite common. Uh, but the second is that uh, destruction was uh, intentional. And here, um, Sena Varma makes the curse that uh, whoever, whichever being may come and destroy the stupa that they fall into Abici. Now this refers to a very specific type of action called an anantaria karma. So it is an action, a karma, which is without a gap, meaning that the um, causal effects of the action are immediately felt and one is born in Abici. Um, so, Theravada, Sarvastivada sources, they define five such actions and most are related to the institutional uh, power of the monastic community. So if you schism a monastery and force the monks to part, if you kill a monk and commit an act of diminicide, or if you destroy a stupa, then you will most certainly be born, reborn uh, in hell. Um, now this is quite well known, these rules. Um, however, the situation is actually far more complicated than this. So we learn here that not all forms of destruction, not all forms of violence towards stupas were regarded uh, as totally transgressive. So we read on destroying a stupa, the 
if a monk angrily destroys a stupa of the fortunate one, he commits a stulatyaya, meaning that the monk must um, expiate his crime uh, before the monastic community, lest he be sort of thrown out. Actions that to crimes have many results. If one desires to repair and improve the stupa, uh, it is not a crime. So this rule was quite clearly created to alleviate the types of anxieties that a monk or indeed uh, another individual might face in actively destroying the architecture of a stupa. And we learned that in such cases as St. Avalon's case, where he enlarged the stupa, that this was regarded as legally acceptable from the perspective uh, of the monastic institution. Um, now, as I suggested earlier, the destruction of stupas was actually a necessity, or it became a necessity among the Buddhists in order that they expand and propagate themselves institutionally uh, into the regions uh, in which they found themselves. Um, and this in turn led to more curious rules regarding how relics were to be acquired. Um, so in one article by Kevin Trainer called When Relic Theft is Not a Theft, um, he points out uh, several narratives uh, from post uh, fifth century Pali literature, uh, which regards the uh, uh, second century stupa establishment of King uh, Duttagamani uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, in which monks uh, make vows, uh, aspirations, pranidana, to steal relics. Uh, and then they go and do so using their uh, riddhi, their supernatural powers from the nagas in Ramagrama, um, and then receive authenticating predictions via karana uh, from the Buddha, um, uh, thereby justifying the theft of relics. Um, so Trainer argued that um, these narratives were designed to circumvent uh, a monastic rule which bans theft among monks. So if a monk commits an act of theft, this is regarded as a parajika, um, it's an act of defeat in which they are thrown out, uh, of, or due to which they are thrown out of the monastic institution. Um, but um, he relied almost exclusively on one source, the Theravada Vinaya, uh, in Pali, which was not current uh, in Gandhara. Um, and it says nothing actually uh, of the case of relic thefts. Now, uh, uh, as far as I was able to ascertain, this particular phenomenon only occurs within the Sarvastivada Vinaya, uh, which was in use uh, uh, within Gandhara. We read, well, Pali further asked, um, if one steals the Buddha's relics, what crime is affected? The Buddha responded saying, a stulachyaya offense. If with gracious intention one thinks the Buddha is truly my teacher, then taking with such pure intention is not a crime. So in this case, um, a monk um, will not be thrown out uh, of the institution as per the normal rule uh, regulation regarding theft, but will rather just have to, um, uh, oh, uh, we're just about to run out of battery. <laughs> Just give me the program somewhere else. Just give me the program. I can. Okay. It's not working. Oh, it's just lost it again. Oh. <laughs> Excuse us, sir. Uh, ah, we're back. We just had an electricity issue. I think it's okay. Yeah. Um, So the reason for it not uh, being the most severe of offences is that the act itself is mitigated by the proper intention, namely that the Buddha uh, is truly my teacher. 
Um, so as such, we have a case here where theft was being prescribed uh, by the monks um, in a context where institutional dissemination was a central question uh, for them. But of course, we learn very little um, about the dimensions uh, of theft here. But in a second example, uh, we get a little bit more detail. It says, taking a Buddhist relic that has an owner, if stolen for one's livelihood, and if it values uh, a full five masha, it is a parajika offense. Not a full five masha, it is a stulatyaya offense. Potentially increasing unwholesomeness, taking for both others and oneself is not a stulatyaya offense. If it is for the sake of performing worship, and then and one thinks that the Buddha is truly my teacher, I should perform worship, and the relic values a full five masha, it is a drishkrita offense. Um, so appreciating the significance of such a passage is, of course, uh, quite difficult. Um, it implies for the context, the historical context in which it was devised, that um, uh, relic theft was perhaps rife uh, among monastics. And it suggests that relics had themselves been commodified uh, as items of trade. They were being weighed and sold as any other um, object, um, as is indicated by the standard measurement uh, Masha. Uh, which is not adjusted typically within the Vinaya for local um, um, uh, meriological measurements and so forth. It's just a standard, um, almost stereotyped weight. Um, um, it also uh, uh, calls into uh, or brings into the equation uh, matters uh, are of ownership. Um, um, but again, um, the theft itself is mitigated uh, by the proper intention, uh, namely that the Buddha uh, is truly my teacher. And if the theft itself is to be considered as richly um, performed and institutionally uh, advantageous, uh, in which case, then it is only a drishkata, which is something like a misdemeanor. Um, it's uh, the monk is not really punished uh, for such an offense. Um, now, risk of theft uh, was not only um, uh, uh, to be attributed uh, to monks, but also to those outside of the purview of institutional discipline. So in another text, the uh, Upasika Panchashilatva Sutra, um, we read the following. If a householder with the intention of stealing steals relics, in committing it, there may be a misdeed. Um, which is, um, yeah, if with a respectful intention, they think thus the Buddha is truly my teacher, then taking with such pure intention uh, is not a crime. Um, so with all of these rules, we're sort of left guessing as to the precise historical circumstances in which a theft may uh, have indeed taken place. Um, but this intention that we saw in each case that the Buddha is truly my teacher uh, may give us a clue because it is found in one other narrative within the Sarvastivada Vinaya, within the legal code of the Sarvastivadins, um, within a unique version of the Maha Parinirvana Sutra. Um, so in this story, um, after the Buddha's Parinirvana, um, his body is taken and uh, cremated uh, by the Malas of Kushinagara. Um, at which point several other groups uh, from the polities of the Gangetic Basin decide that they want to share of these relics um, and um, a potential conflict uh, arises. Um, the last of which was uh, King Ajata Shatru. <clears throat> at that time, King Ajata Shatru directed his great minister, the Brahmin Varshakara, saying, go to Kushinagara where all the malas are, bear my message and extend my immeasurable uh, greetings. Are you strong at ease and well in body and mind? Say to all, the Buddha is truly my teacher and is mine to honor. Today in your domain, he entered Parinirvana. Please divide the relics. I desire to erect a stupa in Rajagriha to perform worship. One who shares with me is good. If you don't share with me, I will force an ar an, an arm, uh, raise an army, sorry, and forcibly seize them from you. Orders received, the ministers promptly assembled a fourfold army unit and went to Kushinagara. Um, ultimately, in the, uh, in the narrative, no violence is required because a Brahmin uh, from the village uh, Drona 
um, intercedes and ends up uh, making eight portions of the relics and distributing uh, them among uh, these different uh, claimants. Um, but we can see that the possibility of theft itself is justified by precisely the same intention as we encounter within the legal codes. And this narrative, therefore, functions as something of a precedent uh, instantiating and justifying uh, the law um, in the Vinaya. And this is a common structure that we find uh, in this text. Um, now, the same justification is also uh, used in another Salvasti Vardin work, namely the Ashoka Avadana. Uh, and um, in this case, we read um, ah, so um, King Ashoka in, in this narrative um, goes to these eight uh, Drona stupas, uh, as they came to be called after the Brahman who um, divided the relics. And again, he goes, destroys the stupa takes out the relics and then spreads them throughout uh, his empire um, uh, on a mass scale. Um, uh, 84,000 uh, is the highest number um, within so-called Dharmarajika stupas, of which, of course, the famous one is in Takshashila. Um, um, so in this text we read, uh, at that time, King Ashoka decides to widely construct Buddha stupas. Assembling a fourfold army, he went to the location of the stupa named Drona, that had been established by King Ajata Shatru. Having arrived, he had the people, uh, namely his soldiers, uh, destroy the stupa and take the Buddha's relics. Um, so such narratives as the Mahaparinirvana Sutra and the Ashoka Avadana um, clearly attempt to wed Buddhism's diffusion to a political agenda uh, by conveying the principle that relics uh, are central to the formation of political power. Um, so instituted into in the intertextual conversation between the two um, is something of a potentially perpetual process um, of expansion, which is itself premised on the codified theft of relics, um, which is ritualized as a practice enacted specifically by political agents. Um, now, if we look at the reception histories of these narratives, um, it becomes very interesting. Uh, so in the 6th century, Emperor Wandi of the Sui dynasty in China, um, he uh, read such narratives as the Ashoka Avadana and potentially our regulations in the Sarvastivada Vinaya and decided to hire um, archaeologists of a kind to go and identify stupas, Dharma, Dharma Rajika stupas within China, within Jambudvipa, of course, because uh, this was the world at that point. Um, uh, and to uh, uh, enact uh, what uh, Eric Zürcher calls a curious kind of excavation, whereby they identified these stupas, destroyed them, took the relics out and redistributed them. Um, a thousand years later, when the British started excavating stupas uh, in, um, in Pakistan, um, um, including at the Damarajika stupa, they likewise uh, did the same. They excavated stupas, destroyed them, took the relics, um, in some cases made exact replicas of the very things that they took out, and then redistributed them throughout Southeast Asia to the Buddhist kingdoms under the British Empire in order to placate political uprisings that had occurred at this time. And in one case, in a letter written by a certain Hoi, who was the um, officiating uh, officer to the region of Ud in the Northwestern provinces, he even cites the Mahaparinirvana Sutra as something of a moral contrast. Um, so in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, there was uh, the cause for violence, you know, of the relics. Um, but he sort of um, pictures the British redistribution of the relics as, um, you know, a peaceful act. Um, um, and therefore, in contrast uh, to that um, violence that had occurred. So, um, yeah, time has sort of told us repeatedly of this nexus between relics and the formation of uh, political power. But of course, these narratives, despite their very interesting um, uh, reception history, um, of course, come from much earlier. So I just wanted to look at one final example, which I think harkens back to the, uh, this uh, story of Ashoka uh, and his uh, theft of relics. Um, so this occurs in another relic rededication by Prince Indravama of the Apracha Rajas uh, governing over Deer Bajawa uh, and Peshawar. Um, and it is found on this inscribed schist uh, circular reliquary again in the Kaharoshti script, which is specifically from Bajawa. Oh, um, 
the provenance is not certain, it's reportedly from Bajara um, and is dated to the beginning of the first century CE. So um, in this text, um, we read, in the 63rd year of the great King Aziz past, uh, King Aziz being the first of the, the third of the Indo-Scythian rulers in the region. Um, on the 16th day of the month Kartika, at this moment of Chitra, Prince Injavarma, son of the Aprachyaraja Vishuvarma, establishes this relic of the fortunate one Shakyamuni at a permanent, deep, previously unestablished location and produces Brahma merits. And these relics were removed from a Maori period stupa and established in a central location that is without danger and without trouble. So among the Aprachyarajas, this uh, history, which placed the origin of the stupa in Gandhara um, at the time of Ashoka and indeed attributed it to Ashoka, uh, was current. And here, uh, yeah, we see this attempt to um, uh, receive and revive uh, the actions, uh, perhaps, uh, stated in that narrative. Um, but we also see that there is a very specific doctrinal formulation, namely the production of Brahma Punya, um, which is something of a cosmological polar to the rule that we saw at the beginning in the inscription of Senavarma, namely that if you destroy a stupa, you go to Avici, but if you establish a new stupa in a previously, unestab uh, previously unestablished location, which is uh, um, 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 then you produce Brahma merits and are reborn in the Brahma heaven, which is the first of the heavens outside of the uh, outside of the Karma Datu in Buddhist cosmology uh, and in the Rupa Datu. So institutionally advantageous actions, um, such as re-establishing a stupa, send you to heaven, whereas those that are disadvantageous uh, send you to hell. Um, so we have seen that um, destruction and theft are somewhat mitigated uh, within these rules and within these narratives in order to address that paradox um, that would have um, stopped Buddhism in its tracks, uh, as it were, uh, in its attempts to disseminate. Um, Now, um, having looked at the relics, um, I want to turn more specifically to the, the signifier itself, to the stupa, because there were also 10 minutes left. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to cut a lot. Tell me when there's five, uh, and then I'll see where I am. <laughs> Um, okay, I think I can go through this next section quickly and then move on to the final part. Yeah. Um, so there are also critiques within monastic circles that are, um, emerge as to the very significance or value of the stupa itself, not only because the Buddha was um, uh, in Pali Nirvana and therefore totally absent, but also because these stupas were uh, designed um, aesthetically to draw patronage and were therefore beautifully decorated and therefore contrary to the very ideals um, that monasticism ostensibly tried to propagate. But at this time, Gregory Chopin in particular has shown that among the Salavastivadins or Mullah Salavastivadins in his case, because he works specifically with the Tibetan translation of that text, um, monasticism was not really of this austere variety that we may expect but was decidedly materialistic. And the art aesthetics and the environs of the monastery and the stupa were a central component of this. So um, monasteries were beautifully decorated with carvings, with paintings, with uh, groves and gardens with various flora and flora and fauna and birds, uh, uh, the sound of birds singing with Pushkarini and so forth. And these were all uh, designed to um, attract, in particular, the patron patronage of wealthy women um, in the local urban settlements. Um, but this is uh, not the whole story. So this um, monastic aesthetic posed a challenge to that aesthetic aesthetic, which was more at home uh, with Buddhism's ideology. Oh, I don't know what's going on.
Um, so in one passage from the Mahasamvika Vinaya, um, <clears throat> we read, if a monk says, the fortunate one has already removed greed, anger, and ignorance. What use is a stupa? He decorates himself for pleasure. What use are flower and fruit gardens? What use is there in a beautiful building with niches, reliefs, carvings, and paintings to make offerings? He transgresses the Vinaya, and the reactions, uh, the results of this action uh, are severe. So uh, we see that critiques um, of this um, uh, opposition between the monastic and the ascetic ascetics um, did not result in uh, the punishment, uh, but rather, um, 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 but rather um, in the, um, yeah, sorry, I just uh, lost myself a little bit. No, no, no. Um, but rather in the support uh, of the use of art uh, and aesthetics uh, in monastic contexts, which is an obvious conclusion uh, as they had to garner patronage. Um, but um, it also points to a more functional question of why this stupa is indeed necessary uh, perhaps again, if the Buddha was in Nirvana. And this, I think, is borne out in another passage um, in the context now of a deity cult. Um, so here we read, the monks took the down karpasa and white woolen clothing in the temple of the gods. The temple guard said, virtuous ones, these items of clothing belong to the temple. Do not take them. Do these clay and wooden gods have use for the items of clothing, the monks said. Then I will also take the items of the stupas of the Buddha and the Arhats, said the temple guard. They informed the Buddha of the case, who said, henceforth, it is not <clears throat> permitted to take the down karpasa and white wooden clothing in temples of the gods. If one takes, takes them, one incurs a stula jaya. So images here are regarded as nothing more than wood and stone. We find that there was a rejection of that ontological assumption that there was an identity between the uh, representation and its subject. Um, images namely had no soteriological value uh, to the Buddhists. They uh, served the ends of health, wealth, uh, longevity and so forth for the devotees of these cults, uh, but they did nothing for the, uh, for the path uh, to liberation. Uh, but we can also see that there is a certain humor within this passage. The irony um, of the temple guards uh, retort here uh, to the mocking uh, position expressed by the monks uh, points also uh, self-reflexively uh, at the paradoxical relation that the monks themselves shared with the stupa, uh, which was a signifier that they, of course, treated as if it had a need, the types of items that were donated uh, at its feet. Um, so the monks clearly regarded the stupa as a mere symbol. Um, as they did uh, images of deities and viewing such images as only wood and stone uh, was an important strategy, no doubt, for the Buddhists uh, to overcome um, these uh, competing cults in the marketplace of ritual. Um, so perhaps we can skip this one since there's not a lot of time. Um, so um, Images were not only at risk of having their clothing stolen from them, uh, but they were also um, subject to uh, iconoclasm, which monks again would do uh, under the same premises. Uh, so here we read, there was a monk who was later in another region where he saw images of Kataputana, Matanga and Kalika and thereupon struck and broke them. At that time, the householder said, these gods lack consciousness. Why then, venerable one, would you destroy them? For this reason, the monks informed the Buddha, who said, monks, you should not destroy images of the gods. Um, so again, we see here that monks destroyed images on the premise that they were purely representational. <clears throat> Um, 
But quite interestingly, the semiotic presence uh, premise, which gave justification for the monks to steal from images of the gods, is here used to criticize the monks for destroying the same, because it points out that if um, indeed a monks wish to uh, actually destroy uh, these gods, then um, such symbolic acts of destruction would essentially be pointless. Um, So um, in these passages, um, the theft and iconoclasm of images of the gods by monks um, is banned. But in other texts, we actually see that it is actively promoted. So we read in one um, narrative from the Jataka Sutra, the Banjing. Uh, in the past, in a foreign land, there was a Brahmana who in service of the gods constructed a temple and a beautifully rendered image of a god with a head made from gold. At one time, a thief climbed up uh, the image of the god and pulled and grabbed at its head, but it didn't budge. He then recited Namo Buddha and was able to remove the head. <laughs> the next morning, the Brahmana was missing the god's head. As the god's head had gone, a crowd assembled, and the god, in losing the head, so lost its potency. The spirit explained to one Brahmana, a thief grabbed my head but was unable to obtain it. He then recited Namo Buddha, which startled the gods, and so he obtained my head. Gods are unlike the Buddha, the Brahman has exclaimed, and they all went into the service of the Buddha, never again to serve the gods. Um, so here, of course, the assumption is that the image does indeed have agency, and it is specifically the head uh, that is targeted. And this is a, a common practice that we find in acts of iconoclasm throughout history. Uh, it's a, it is a step uh, also that was made um, by the Protestants in Europe, who first... Um, <clears throat> Ren who first rendered the images empty of agency, considering them nothing more than wood and stone. They saw them purely as signs. Um, but when it came to dealing with these images um, and the response uh, in this case of fear um, uh, through acts of iconoclasm, um, they target those, targeted those mm -hmm. things which would appear to give vitality and agency to the image, namely the heads and the hands. And this is uh, something that we also encounter quite regularly uh, within Gandhara uh, or in Hampi as well, of course. Um, um, unfortunately, we um, are unable to really decide from the archaeological context whether such um, uh, defacements, uh, for instance, of this image of Skanda Kili Mahisha here, are the acts of iconoclasm or the results of the contingencies of time and um, excavation and so forth. Um, so I think um, leaving that aside, I just wanted to very briefly at the end here, I have a few more minutes. Okay. Um, I, uh, very briefly just turn to one final episode in this tale of destruction and theft, uh, namely the Buddha image. Um, so the Buddha image emerged slightly later than the stupa cult, most likely in the first century uh, turn of the common era uh, uh, period. Um, but we have, of course have to ask ourselves in light of the rules that we just uh, have just seen regarding um, the ontology of images, how the Buddha image was itself uh, a possibility. Um, did the ideology propagated among these monastics of Buddhism not negate the very thing that they were producing before they had even decided to produce it? Um, the Buddha's body was likely, likewise regarded to be as unportrayable. Um, and there are many narratives in which artists are trying to represent him, but can't quite uh, hold the image uh, in their mind enough to get it down onto the paper. And in the end, the Buddha intercedes and produces a model uh, from which they can then work. <laughs> um, but um, the Buddhists did not uh, initially abandon the semiotic premises that governs their views of figural imagery. Um, and um, this is uh, indicated by one story from the Kalpana Manditika Drishtanta Pankti in Chinese translation, um, which regards a, a story of the Arhat, Arhat Upagupta and his encounter with Mara. Um, and um, Upagupta uh, enters into meditation and then he wishes to see the form of the Buddha, uh, Upagupta being a contemporary of Ashoka, and he appears uh, as a figure in the Ashoka Avadana. Um, 
And uh, Mara agrees to don the costume of the Buddha, but reluctantly, because if Upagupta were to worship Mara, the Mara would be destroyed by the force of the worship. Um, but he does so, and nonetheless, Upagupta falls before Mara's feet in the form of the Buddha uh, in prostration. And then at that time, King Mara said, you fall with five limbs on the ground and worship me. Why did you say I won't honor you? I'm not worshipping you, Venerable Upagupta said to Mara, and I have not reneged on my promise also. Just as when clay or wood are used to fashion a Buddha image, which men and the gods of the world all worship, they at that moment do not honour the clay and wood, but wish to worship the Buddha. Likewise, I worship the representation of the Buddha and not the form of Mara. Um, so Buddha images were likewise regarded as signs, as only wood and stone. Um, whether they are uh, regarded as iconic signifiers in representing the form of the Buddha or indexical, indeed in doubly indicating his uh, absence uh, and of course his presence. Um, <clears throat> um, but they were also fundamentally aids to meditation whereby the image of the Buddha in one's mind becomes the true object of, of veneration. So images are a sign in this case for what ought to be worshiped rather than things um, uh, themselves. Um, so they were empty shells, and this is indicated in the ways in which images were treated. So um, in one rule, uh, we read, if an image has relics and one takes it, it is a patayantika. Without relics, it is a dirishklita. If one produces a thought of the great teacher, taking it uh, is not a crime. Um, so... Um, images were regarded as redundant without that enlivening property, that essential nature uh, of the corporeal uh, relic of the Buddha, uh, which uh, gave the uh, image value. And if one steals an image with relics, then it is a patayantika, meaning you go to Avicii, uh, you uh, uh, suffer a fall. Um, yeah. um, but without relics, the image is essentially worthless. It is a misdemeanor to steal such an image. Um, now, um, images therefore were not regarded as living persons and they were also not treated as such. And I think this is indicated here, um, uh, which will be the final image I show today. Um, in, um, <laughs> um, uh, here where uh, Buddha images are used as the bricks and the architectural supports, in this case, um, to build a stupa. And this is quite common throughout archaeological, archaeological excavations in Gandhara, where you find a Buddha's head stuck out of a wall um, or an arm here and there. Um, so the material value of these objects was far greater than their symbolic or their uh, uh, sacred uh, function. Um, but this was this would not remain the case. So we see that by the fifth century, Buddha images are re-endowed with agency, so to say. Um, this is found in certain passages of uh, the Mulasavastivada Vinaya, and it is also found um, um, within texts uh, from Sri Lanka of about the same period, where uh, painting the eyes uh, of a Buddha image is, is what introduces uh, the vitality to it. Um, we also find in Paxila uh, at the Dhammarajika site that Buddha images were later buried as if they were living persons. So this uh, moment in which the Buddha image was only viewed as wood and stone was quite brief. It lasted for less than half a millennium as far as I've been able to uh, determine. Um, so just uh, uh, this basically concludes my presentation. I forgive, uh, I apologize for running over time. and. <laughs> Um, so we've seen a number of paradoxical themes uh, uh, within uh, this story of uh, destruction and theft. Um, now, what I think this all suggests is that the Buddhists made uh, uh, a, big, a big step in the philosophical history of South Asia. They made what may be described as a, a semiotic turn. They rejected uh, the typical uh, ideas that were associated with figural imagery, uh, with art, um, and rather produced uh, an array of their own signifiers, their own symbols, which were themselves meaningless uh, and only um, to be treated materially, um, but were of course um, 
uh, <coughs> adequate media in pointing to the power which they sought to signify and the meanings that they sought to represent uh, in communicating uh, themselves to the society. So I thank you for listening. <laughs> I've got a question for you that maybe yeah, we need the uh, shared screen and uh, I don't know if I should be mediated or to be next to you. Maybe it goes on to an only to set their questions. Yeah, maybe yeah. 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 people can raise their hands. Do you mind I'll, I'll, um, I've got an eye on the chat, so if anyone uh, online would like to ask a question, you can uh, type and I will uh, respond. They can also raise Or you can raise your hand and talk. I made a few. <laughs> I stopped the ball. No one comes. Uh, I have a few. But I yeah, please go then, please. So I will uh, also bring on the Yeah, I go and uh, yeah, please get there. Begin and we go one after the other. I can turn the camera to the person. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you, Henry, for this very interesting uh, meeting and the way that works with different families there. I, uh, I mean, got me, it set me off thinking of in different directions. The so first, which is more of a technical point, is to know like. What is the word for relics that they use in this text? If the uh, word or this opposite or this term there. And the second is tension between um, what one would seem to be in the jurisprudence arising from, um, from, uh, from a monastic religious order and it's uh, the dynamics that it tries to you know, like shape. So, but that's so much of the secular because these rulers were officially you know, like their patrons of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But then, did it, in a way, was it also a kind of an interference with an older order, which in that way, like, you know, this where we touch upon the, uh, uh, the religions and practices of uh, Vedic religions. And this was, was this the kind of pathway that was it one of the pathways that it took in order to? Kind of try to resolve uh, what could have been similar intentions, various points. Um, I think you have to be more specific as to the second. I'm quite, I'm not quite sure what what specifically about uh, what I showed. Um, yeah, would be a challenge to existing ritual sorts of complexes. A lot of the rituals, but I think in terms of the Jewish, the, the codification of the uh, mm -hmm. laws and with regards to the text itself, was it more to uh, you know, like uh, perhaps was it because of the, the presence of something older as an order of uh, you know like of a uh, with regards to uh, crime and theft was this the agenda having to change hmm. this i don't know i actually did not expand my research to look at uh secular notions of theft i didn't look at the Adsa Shastra, for example, which would be the first point to turn in this case. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know something that might enlighten uh, me. Just, in fact, just got the <laughs> like it just like a... Yeah. Um, so I've I've uh, I've not I've not done this. I mean, so if you look at the development of the Vinaya, I mean, so theft is um, in the Prati Moksha, theft is just banned. You can't steal. And then, of course. As you encounter different moments in life, <laughs> then it's not the same as you know, like theft of cattle or theft of you know, no, of course not. Yeah, yeah. so you have yeah. different types of theft, yeah, which exactly. are determined by the context, how far you take the object from the place from which it was stolen, how much it weighs, etc., etc. Et um, and this structure of adding amendments uh, to sort of root rules, um, I don't know. Um, to what extent that mirrors jurisprudence more generally uh, at this time. I don't know if we have the sources um, uh, to uh, make such a conclusion, actually. Or, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you uh, uh, anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are two terms used for uh, relics in these texts. 
and in these inscriptions, uh, the first is uh, Sharira. 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 So the body. body. Yeah. And then the second is Dahatu. Um, and it is very difficult to determine the semantic difference between these two things. So there are, I mean, I was toying with the idea that um, because in this inscription of Sena Varma, the first term to use to refer to the relic is Sharira. Yeah. Uh, but then once it's rededicated, it becomes Dahatu. Likewise, in the Ashoka Abhidhana, um, you end up with the Sharira Dahatu following this process of, uh, re uh, of distribution and rededication. Um, so it's all, I mean, the Dhatu just, I mean, it just it would appear to indicate that elemental essence of the Buddha's corporeality. Um, but they, so they appear to be used interchangeably, both in Pali and, uh, and in Sanskrit. Um, in Chinese, um, they often just transcribed sh Sharira with Shirley, um, or they just have the term for body, Shan. Um, and then the Dhatu, um, I don't know if the term, uh, the translation, uh, the Hatu, which is uh, Jie in Chinese, was used in the context of uh, relics. Um, I'd have to double check this. Um, yeah, so it's very hard to distinguish between the two, actually. Um, yeah. There's a, uh, Natasha? Natasha. Ah, did you write in the chat or would you like to? Oh, I'll just say it. Um, yes. So I'm curious. What would they think about the modern kind of like pop culture Buddha image being used, you know, like in the Western yoga studios, just very casually, um, not in a form of worship, but as a like pop culture cool thing to have? Well, I mean, this is uh, sort of um, an interesting point because it concerns the, uh, the notion of art, actually. Um, so um, the image within pop culture it implies a certain objective distance that one acquires through the category of art. So the Buddhists um, would have appeared to have made a, a very uh, similar step, uh, would they not? Um, namely these, um, so art um, yeah, became um, important as a reaction to um, uh, as a Protestant reaction first to Catholicism, uh, but then as a secular reaction to Protestantism, uh, whereby the object was purely for its own aesthetic enjoyment, uh, was not to be worshipped as an icon uh, and so forth. Um, and this is certainly the notion, popular notion of an image that we might find um, uh, today. But the Buddhists, I think, took another step. Um, so they also, um, identified the aesthetics of imagery um, and the unwanted uh, emotional sensations that derive from these different aesthetics that could be fear uh, pleasure uh, etc uh, but then they also negated uh, those aesthetics um, and did so just by making these images signs uh, as being empty shells uh, essentially um, and I think that this is uh, the status of an image in popular culture today, is it not? Um, it is quite obviously uh, a signifier, a form of media, a medium used uh, to articulate uh, a specific ideology, um, which may not be Buddhist, of course, in the case of a Buddha image, but associated with, um, I don't know, an Orientalist pop culture, actually, as it often, ari uh, as it often arises. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. And Sharat. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I have I missed uh, the first I think twenty minutes of your talk, but uh, uh, I have a few questions. I'll go one by one. Uh, the first one is with the with respect to the stupa as a structure. Uh, uh, there are evidences uh, and petroglyphs basically uh, in Ladakh uh, and in parts of Pakistan uh, where stupas uh, have been dated to pre-Buddha, for example. So 
are you linking uh, uh, the stupa as a structure uh, uh, architectural structure with buddhism and with no cultural background uh, so the if the structure itself has then maybe i mean uh, is there room to think that buddhist uh, took an existing uh, structural framework uh, and then adopted it uh, and the second one with respect to uh, the aesthetics of uh, buddhism is that in in the text bardo todol uh, uh, written by padma sambhava uh, you would have heard heard his name he okay uh, uh, bardo in the bardo bardo yes bardo uh, yes. Uh, in the text padma sambhava describes uh, the process of how the soul trans migrates from one body to the other so in that in that text he i am not able to quote him uh, but there is visual representations of how uh, uh, you know how you need to meditate on the buddha uh, the image of the buddha he invokes the three ratnas uh, so there is an aesthetic element involved uh, even in the buddhist uh, you know post that uh, process uh, even towards nirvana when the soul is moving towards nirvana uh, there are you know descriptions of how hell will be so basically the uh, the demons and the things that are represented in the buddhist monasteries and even in the buddhist festivals uh, in northwest india and in the himalayan regions is actually meant to prepare you uh, to how your uh, to have an idea of the imagery when you die and when you go into hell so there is an aesthetic element or uh, you know a, a very crucial aesthetic element involved uh, in uh, the you know the process of nirvana and uh, the way Bud- buddhism treats imagery and uh, aesthetic so if you have uh, some light uh, to throw on that aspect as well i would really love to thank you thank you that's a very uh, uh, interesting last question i'll begin with the first um so um Yes, uh, the stupa is pre-Buddhist. I mean, in Buddhist sources themselves, we have um, four types of individ- individuals which are considered as uh, worthy uh, of a stupa, um, namely a Chakravartin, an Arhat, um, uh, also a queen and a Buddha. Oh, and a Prajeka Buddha. Um, there's a very long study by André Barrow um, uh, called uh, Sur la construction de stupa. And uh, in this, he elaborates and he collates all data regarding stupas in Chinese, Sanskrit and Pali literature. And he found that actually stupas were rather commonplace as well. Um, So if we just look at Pali sources, we see that the stupa is somewhat just reserved for these individuals and specifically the Chakravartin. Of course, the Buddha is somatically identical to to the Chakravartin. Um, but actually, there are passages which imply that the stupa is, was far more widespread. Now, uh, the difficulty, of course, is um, situating these passages historically. Um, so burying an individual um, in South Asian context is, of course, um, uh, not entirely common. Um, yeah. So um, this is quite clear. Um, yeah, I mean... There are also some art, there's some art from Sanchi uh, where you have these um, sort of black manacle, they're not stupas in, as we know from sort of Jain and Buddhist depictions. Uh, yeah, maybe they're called chaitas, um, but they could be these, uh, you know, these edukha from the Mahabharata. Uh, um, it's a very uh, unusual term that no one really understands, um, but it could denote these like topes which is cognates with stupa, so I don't know why I used it, but the tope that uh, goes over a, um, a body um, was also uh, apparently practiced um, um, widely uh, in Brahmanical societies as well. Um, so I would I would point you to Barrow because I think that this article um, remains the best sort of um, um, interrogation of this question um, still. Um, sorry? Yeah, I, don't, uh, I don't know this. Um, now the aesthetics in the Bardo. So um, I, um, I'm not so familiar with uh, Tibetan Buddhism. So I'm going to tackle this from an angle with which I'm more familiar. Um, 
So there are two points, perhaps. So I think that we, when we look at aesthetics in Buddhism, um, emotions and so aesthetic objects and aesthetic responses to objects um, were divided, um, namely from the perspective of Buddhism's telos. So there are those emotions which are conducive to liberation and those which are not. Um, those which are not, so for example, a beautiful image which produces pleasure. Now this pleasure is more of a karma. It's a sensual pleasure of sexual passion, of desire. Um, this is to be distinguished from uh, sukha, which is produced by um, a Buddha image, which is also pleasure. Uh, but this sukha is more like, you know, uh, it's the bliss that one experiences through meditative practice. It's the bliss one experiences when one enters into dhyana um, and, you, uh, and sees Buddha images um, in one's mind. Um, now these, this, um, this is part of a project that is yet to come that I've not yet really begun, but I started looking at um, Buddha images in the Sarvastivada Abhidhamma, uh, and in particular in the Chinese translation of the Mahavibhasha. And in there, we um, see an attempt to define these, um, the emotional causality of Buddha images. Um, so for example, if you see a Buddha image, then you, um, you, it gives rise to pleasure. Or if you see a Buddha image that is broken and you repair it and you make it beautiful again, um, then you in a future life um, um, become beautiful yourself. Um, it's uh, darshaniya in Sanskrit, you know, this typical formula um, uh, that you find. Um, so there was this um, uh, systematic attempt to, to define the types of aesthetic responses you have in relation to different objects within um, sort of the Buddhist world, uh, the Buddhist imaginaire, so to say. Um, now, uh, in a second case, um, the Buddha image uh, in meditation, I referred to it briefly in one of the stories I quoted, um, was uh, central um, to the um, uh, emotional state of mind and the production of specific emotional states such as priti, uh, sukha, uh, and so forth. Um, and this um, um, uh, appears in um, meditation texts of which I have a project on uh, called uh, the Yoga Lehrbuch or the Buddhist Yoga Manual, which is a Sanskrit manuscript that was discovered in Xinjiang in China, um, as well as in other um, visualization sutras that are only extant in Chinese and some in Takaria now uh, from Central Asia. Um, uh, and in these texts, uh, the Buddha image um, becomes a, uh, an object um, of the practitioner's mind. Um, sometimes utilizing an external Buddha image as uh, a prompt uh, to produce a, you know, a clear image. Um, but uh, in these cases, it becomes instrumental to the production of certain uh, aesthetic states. But again, those that are only conducive um, uh, to liberation. Now, again, in the hells, in the case of the hells, the hells um, are also an object of these meditations, uh, perhaps as they might be in the case of the Bardo. Um, uh, and, uh, in this case, um, again, like focusing on the hells is also used to produce particular emotive states. So, um, um, if you want to, um, produce a state of, um, uh, of Maitri, um, or, um, of, um, of, uh, 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 no, not not a karuna uh, in this case, um, but of sympathetic joy. Then you uh, have to see that sentient beings are suffering within the hells, uh, and through this, this um, uh, feeling of sympathy uh, is produced for these beings, which again is instrumental um, uh, to the Buddhist soteriological path. And I don't know to what extent that is relevant to the context of the bardo, but I can imagine that certain elements of what I said are uh, somewhat relevant. The more time you spend in the battle, the more evil the representation comes from. But the, so the idea, the, the teachings in the battle is that you should not identify with the representation. If you do, then you're reborn according to the emotion or the, you want the grasping that comes with the representation. The idea that you should see this as representation and choose the underlying light. There is an underlying light, 
at the moment of death, if you catch that light, you immediately go to heaven to nirvana. So all the rest is representation, and they go and decay day by day into the range of 49 days. Uh, and they identifying with the representation means being reborn in the realm of that, or in the quality of that, or the rebirth of that representation. So there is a bit of a, a mix of the aesthetics we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. under the, yeah. Did that did that answer your question, Sharat? Oh, uh, uh, it did partially, but I have a uh, with the last you know question. I mean, answer about the bardo. Uh, the thing is, even though you are entering you know worse and worse off state, you still I mean the uh, the evil represent re representations are still playing a role because e even then, even at the very last stage, you still have an opportunity to turn towards the light. So uh, it, it it shows that there is an aesthetical, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, aesthetics is not just for the sake of it. There is still a role it is playing to guide you towards the light. So uh, I I don't know if we can say that, you know, uh, the, you to just keep uh, the aesthetical representation and keep the meaning away from it because it the aesthetic representation is what is guiding you away from it and towards the light. So there is an important role and an inherent meaning in. Uh, that itself uh, is it not? I mean, uh... well, I mean, uh, I think, uh, but I mean, the point at which a mind becomes liberated, it requires uh, to be um, uh, equanimous, upeksha, to be tranquil, prasada, and prasada um, is a very interesting concept in Buddhism because it is an unesthetic, ascetic experience. Um, it is an experience which derives from an aesthetic response to an object, but at the same time is the rec recognition of the nature of that response. So it is the recognition that, si that a representation um, is a representation, that it does not um, have the embodied power to produce um, uh, a response by necessity, yes? Um, so I, uh, although, these images and I mean, in the meditation text I work on, these emotions actually become embodied figures. Sympathetic joy, compassion, uh, they have embodiments. It's called an adi, uh, adipati rupa, a dominant image. And these images come and talk to you and they in, interact with you. You see them in your meditation and they push you in the right way. Um, but of course they are themselves not directly soteriologically uh, um, effective, yeah. So I think we have to distinguish these things, uh, but this is the, these the complicated workings of meditation, of course. So. Perhaps the last round of questions, then we can. Okay, thanks. I mean, I would have perhaps two uh, questions. There's one in the chat, but- I, I didn't see this one. Uh, is this person Jane still there? Anchit Jane. Uh, no. Ah, yes, yes. Um, so John Huntington, whilst forwarding his arguments against an iconicism in early Buddhist art, pointed that the Vinaya actually lacks any prescriptions against making the making of Buddha images. What do you think on this issue based on your study of the Vinaya and archaeology? Um, so my understanding was that John Huntington actually argued for an iconism, uh, whereas his wife, Susan Huntington, recently argued against, against it. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, um, so an iconism, um, uh, I would suggest, is um, a, a direct result of the type of semiotic that I um, lay out uh, today, uh, because um, it is overtly um, semiotic, in fact, because the absence of the Buddha in these images directly points to his absence in Nirvana. Um, and I think this has been quite widely discussed by uh, many scholars. Um, now, as regards the prescri prescriptions against the making of Buddha images, so if we look at different Vinaya in Chinese, uh, then we, uh, yeah, we get um, different views. So um, I didn't address this in my presentation, but the first images that were produced in South Asia were actually images of the Bodhisattva. 
as far as we can tell from dated Brahmi inscriptions from Mathura, Sarnath, and so forth. Now, this correlates to certain Vinaya regulations where it is stated that uh, uh, only the Bodhisattva may be represented. A later emendation um, to the Murasavastivada Vinaya does account for the fact that Buddha images can be produced, but this must belong to a later time. Um, but this is a very uh, um, this is a very difficult issue, as particularly when one tries to consider the Vinaya in relation to archaeology, because um, the window in which we can date a Bodhisattva image and a Buddha image is very small. And it only relies on dated inscriptions, uh, which does not account for um, art historical methods, um, which would place some Buddha images still earlier than those dated inscriptions. So from the archaeological and epigraphic sides, there's a long debate over this that has gone back, you know, from the time of Usher and Shubaraswami uh, and continues on. Uh, and then to correlate these with these Vinaya rules, and again, the 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 Chinese language in these rules is very difficult to understand. And there's, there's a very nice article by Zhu Xiong Ri, um, who actually points out that um, um, there's one particular um, character in Chinese, uh, which is uh, shi, which means time. Uh, and the passage would appear to read something like, um, you can make an image from the time of the Bodhisattva, meaning that when the Buddha was not yet a Buddha, um, but actually, um, um, ah, so I've got it the wrong way around. It reads shi, which means an attendant, an attendant bodhisattva, namely a bodhisattva that appears with an image. But actually, this is probably uh, a mistake. Um, uh, and there's an, argue, uh, an article by Zhu Ri, as I said, that argues um, uh, for this other reading that it is from the time of the bodhisattva. Um, so at every level, of this discussion, there are problems. Um, and I don't think that there are very um, any very clear conc uh, conclusions to make. Um, isn't it that some images of Buddha from Gandhara are older? Exactly. Yeah, so this is the problem. So um, some images from Swat in particular um, are regarded as earlier than the Kapadin uh, Bodhisattvas uh, discussed. Um, but those um, images are not dated. Um, and uh, I do not fully rely on art, art historical uh, methodology, to be honest. I have two brief ones, if you don't mind. Uh, one's about the, the process, as you described, of stealing, um, spreading relics, and so forth. Uh, I was wondering if it's something according to you, which is typically Buddhist, or like, do you know in other cultural, like, say, the Catholics were really involved in relics production, transmissions, and so forth. Did they also um, somehow care to steal? I can imagine this, mm -hmm. like the power of stealing and so forth and reproducing. So, do we see the same kind of human patterns in dealing with relics beyond the Buddhist world? Or is that not particularly Buddhist? No, in medieval Europe, uh, this was a big thing stealing relics. There's a book called uh, Furta Sanctum which goes into this uh, topic extensively. Um, and of course, you know, relics were the means to, um, to get political power, to get um, institutional power for a specific church in a specific region um, in Ghent, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure many uh, relics were stolen from Ghent, you know, sent to Antwerp or something like this. Um, so this was common practice, yeah, as was the destruction of relics um, uh, during the iconoclastic fury of the 16th century. But that was not the destruction to spread, it was destruction, destruction. Right? Yeah, 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 this was reaction to Catholicism, yeah. But I don't know what um, spreading would mean in this context, so I don't know whether relics were used for the propagation of Christianity into new locales. So for Buddhism, it was specifically the establishment of a relic in a new location that produced this specific type of merit. So this was the um, the ideology that they were pushing. And I don't know about this. And, uh, I think in Eastern Europe, for example, relics would be brought in uh, for the establishment of communities. But I, I'm 
I can imagine that was the case. Yeah, and also the founding of a new cathedral, perhaps anywhere in Europe. Um, I mean, it would be, uh, um, yeah, important perhaps to have a relic. But I, but I don't know the nuances of this history. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I can I can send you a book on the topic. I just didn't read it in detail. My uh, other one was about. Um, was I was curious if at some point there is a I mean relics are uh, replaced by mantras or texts mm. or Tarani or so forth, mm. right? I mean, uh, when does that happen? And how is that, how can one explain that shift? From... Mm. Yeah, this was uh, something I was thinking about because, um, so at some, like I said, you know, the, these relic establishments, archeologically, they occur in a very brief window. So we're talking, um, early first century BCE till third century CE, at which point we don't really see any inscriptions recording the establishment of relics. So they disappear. At the same time, you start to have this, these little clay objects with the Ye Dharma Petu Prabhava formula written on them, uh, which is somehow um, a reduction of the entire um, Dharma Sharira, the body of teaching, to a single phrase, which was regarded as equivalent to the Buddha's body. So these start appearing at this time. They are transmitted to China throughout Central Asia. Century. Yeah, so post third century, you start to uh, see these things. Uh, there's even a very nice uh, text uh, in which the establishment of this formula produces Brahma Punya as well. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know what this means actually. So why suddenly real relics disappear? And perhaps another another point to add is that, so in the early period, relic establishments were only enacted by very wealthy individuals in Gandhara, by rulers, almost exclusively rulers. Um, but in later periods, the practice becomes more, um, popular uh, among a greater demographic. So you have uh, figures with some wealth, um, but less wealth because the material value of the dedications reduces. Uh, and also there um, is an absence of relics in many of these dedications. Now, that meaning there's an absence of bone or an absence of um, little bits of grain or something. You also find sort of imposter relics like I mean, this it's a bit silly to discuss it in these terms, but you find bits of animal bone and things. I mean, things that the individual knew or one individual at some point knew was not a relic, so to say. Um, so there was this shift already uh, towards sort of the second to third century where there's a widening of the practice, a reduction in material uh, value and an absence of relics. And then suddenly the production of this formula which is like an essentialization somehow of the Buddhist teaching and the notion of corporeality, but even further in the line of, in, in the line of signification, yeah? It's, this is a purely a symbol, um, unmistakably a symbol. So the Buddhists still went further in this regard, and I don't know if this dovetails with certain steps in philosophy that occurred, for example, with the Yogacara, which is, overtly uh, referential in its understanding of experience or um, yeah, substitution just in general yeah. um, so I think that perhaps this step could also be correlated with philosophical changes that occurred within the Buddhist fold um, but this is all speculation and perhaps to conclude one because you mentioned that in the fifth century is the relation of Buddhist image is somehow revalued in favor of producing them and having them in the monasteries and so forth. I was wondering why you think the fifth century, because if I think of fifth century, I think of mm. I mean, beginning of social rivalries between sects and somehow the process I go for five centuries so eventually it was decline. But is it is it you think in due to the social context where competitors are also quite engaged in producing perhaps their own idols or then what why in the same fifth century is uh, changes where the monastic cause is not changing 
so the philosophy is changing. But... Well, the ma massacre was still changing. Okay. If you follow our certain arguments of Gregory Chopin, because so you suddenly you um, in the fifth century across South Asia you have the appearance of the Gandakuti, like the fragrance hall, um, and this is a dedicated room where the Buddha image was ritually placed, and the presence of the Buddha was being was regarded as being in this room. Um, although the notion of uh, Pari Bahavita is like with this perfumes by the Panchashila Skanda, I find to be perhaps quite relevant to this uh, this fragrance room, you know, that it was still fragranced by the Buddha's presence somehow, um, uh, or permeated or suffused. Uh, yeah. um, as to why, uh, uh, which is correlated with passages in the Mula Sabastivada Vinaya, according to Gregory Schoenberg. Um, why then, I don't know, I mean, for me, there were always rivalries, um, and I think they became quite acute in the context with which I'm speaking, particularly because you have an influx of, um, where well, you have the dissolution of the Mauryan Empire, first of all, um, you have the Shungas pushing up, you have the Indo-Greeks pushing down, followed by a series of others, um, and these were not Buddhists, they weren't Brahmins, they weren't Jains, you know, so it was a uh, fair game for everyone. Yeah, so there was a push uh, to attract the support of these rulers. And the rulers themselves, the Kushanas, they established their own cults of themselves at this time. Some of the earliest images we have are of rulers as well. Uh, in coins, you know, the first real uh, images we see are in coins. Um, so for me, like this, um, I mean, this type of context um, where we have narratives of competition emerging, um, we have the notion of the decline of the Dharma um, emerging at this time. So I think that we have um, a lot of conflict already here. And I, I mean, this can somehow, I mean, I argue that it can be related to certain institutional acts like establishing relics. Um, so I don't really know why the re-endowment of the Buddha image with agency, because it would appear to sort of return back to the very thing that they criticized, would it not? Well, the beginning of Tantra. But Tantra, does Tantra do that? I mean, my understanding of certain Anuttara uh, yogini tantras is that it does precisely the opposite of that that it really adopts this yogacara sort of hermeneutic of reality but um I, I mean i'm not so intimate with the tantras um yeah i mean do you have any thoughts on it yourself i mean i don't really have a good answer for you yeah yeah that's true we should uh, um, you had a question but well, maybe we should finish. I can, yeah. We can talk afterwards. Maybe I don't know yes. if we should close. Yeah. But I'll come and. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, so thank you, Henry, and for everybody's patience. Uh, thank you for those who are still online to have been with us. It's a pleasure uh, to have you. I guess we will have more of these events in the near future. Thank you for the attendance of your patience, too. That's a great lecture. And uh, well, we will continue offline. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all for listening again. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, no. Thank you, Henry. Is it good?